Right. So the last session for the day is about analytic tools implementation considerations. So this presentation, unfortunately, is going to be a discussion of a uh, lot of uh, concepts and experiences and best practices. So it will be uh, the slides will be somewhat full of text, but we will try to keep it as uh, interactive and interesting as possible. Uh, but but this is a really important consideration, uh, really important presentation that uh, all of you will have to um, uh, be mindful of if you are uh, especially representing national level of a Ministry of Health or, or, or an organization who will be in charge of uh, implementing uh, data analysis and data use uh, in your context. Right. Okay, so uh, regarding the word of the day, uh, we are having some issues. Our team is looking into uh, that and they will fix it and let us know. Right. Okay. Right. So first of all, now when we are implementing DHIS2, we have to be really mindful of local requirements, right? So the thing is, what I mean by local requirements is, now in this academy, we mainly present to you about uh, how in, in a very generic way you can implement your analytic tools. So we have discussed about... Uh, how you can set up uh, your visualizations, how to put them in dashboards, and how to uh, create data to action uh, frameworks and uh, basically interpretations, right? Uh, so all these are conceptual things. And as I have been always highlighting, when you go back to your country's context, you have to decide out of all these uh, good practices that we have learned in the academy, how can I apply it into my country's context? So the thing is, like, uh, uh, even though we talked about this in very generic way, it really depends on your program managers because everyone uh, interprets the way they, they have to use the data in the country context or in the program context in a different way, right? So you may feel like uh, maybe your program manager or the uh, medical administrator, health administrator who's in charge of the program might decide, okay, we will have few dashboards or just one or two of them. Right? Or as we may have many of them. Uh, and sometimes you may, uh, they may even think, right, uh, DHIS2 may not be able to serve some requirements. Right? They, they may have different opinions. So this is when even some countries might decide uh, there are some limitations in the existing DHIS2 analytic tools. So what can we do about it? So there are so many things that you can do about it. We will talk about what we can do one by one. But one thing that we have noted uh, quite often in recent times is to have custom applications developed on top of DHIS2. So I'm not talking about a separate website or separate web application. I'm talking about an application which is installed inside DHIS2, but it has custom visualizations, not the usual layouts that you are seeing in uh, data visualizer, pivot table, and maps, right? So these are very custom visual, uh, custom layouts, custom interfaces that you have in a custom web map. So this is one extreme way of having uh, the visualizations we required incorporated into your DHS2 instance, right? And also uh, uh, you may have to provide training on using the apps to generate the outputs along with interpreting, right? And using these outputs uh, also uh, has to be catered in a country specific way. So the, uh, this is again a one of my responses to uh, one question asked about how to set uh, the action parameters in a, a data to action framework. So it is country specific. We have to decide and we have to have a discussion with the relevant stakeholders and decide what are the uh, limits that we are setting, right? And in general, what is even more required is to prepare a culture of regular data use in the country. So, uh, we know the situation in most countries. I personally have worked in several countries in different Ministry of Health scenarios. So it's it's more or less same in most of the countries. It's just that um, the only the degree of uh, the uh, data use culture changes, right? But in general, most of the countries, at least at the field level, right, the the where you have the majority of the users, they are mostly collecting data. They are not using the data, right? They just collect. But they are not looking at uh, how to, I mean, what is the data we have collected? Is there any relationship with, between different data that we have collected? No, this thing is not happening. So one most difficult but effective task that you may have to do is to uh, design a culture of regular data use. So there are different ways of doing that, uh, which are like, I mean, uh, depending on the socio-technical scenario in the country. 
but uh, uh, you definitely have to create this culture of data use for it to get implemented, okay? And then uh, when you initially uh, uh, go to a country, right? Uh, and when you assume the role of a uh, analytic tools expert, right? Uh, what you can do? So what uh, maybe a good starting point is to outline the different outputs that are currently generated and being reviewed in the uh, in the country. So this may be within the DHS two instance or maybe outside. So for for example, if you if you uh, are trying to start something fresh, uh, there are maybe three possibilities, right? One is the country doesn't have electronic information system, or at least the program doesn't have any electronic information system in general. Yeah, they are just referring to uh, you know the charts that are hanging on uh, notice boards and places like that. Maybe they are using an existing third-party uh, system, which may have some very specific uh, visualizations, or else they may be uh, using DHIS2, right? So what you can do is, in case it is not in DHIS2, you, you have to analyze the situation and see what are, uh, I mean, out of these uh, visualizations, which are presently there, which are the ones you can implement it in uh, DHIS2, right? Or else, also look at, like, uh, if you have a DHIS2 instance, uh, you can have a look at the existing dashboards and visualizations, and you can think how you can enhance the features that are the, currently there. Maybe the, the, the visualizations are too many or too overwhelming. They don't have proper interpretations uh, which are embedded so that people actually can't make any uh, proper uh, uh, I mean, use of uh, the visualization. So these are the things that you have to initially take into account. right? And then you outline what are the new outputs that are possible with the newer versions of DHIS2, right? And again, you can assess if any outputs uh, may require custom solution, right? So it may be a custom application within DHIS2, or maybe we may have to send data which are there in DHIS2 to outside. So now I'm mentioning few uh, newer or high-tech approaches, which you may not be uh, familiar with, but just know like these things are possible. So for example, we can even send data out of DHIS2 into another platform. This is possible if, if it really requires. And also, uh, well, you can what you can do is you may be able to provide a demo using in-country data. So for example, if you are trying to introduce DHIS2 to a totally new set of people, if possible, you can try to you know, set up a demo instance with their own data. So when you actually see your own data, if any country person sees their own data, they are in a better position to actually uh, appreciate what you have done in the DHS2 system, rather than you try to uh, log into the play demo and show Sierra Leone data, right? So, I mean, that's something that you can always think of doing. Maybe uh, a bit difficult if you don't have uh, proper access to data, but uh, if the country thinks like, uh, maybe you can have an initial discussion and then uh, followed by that, if they want a in-detail discussion, at that point, you can use this in-country data. Uh, so that you can go for a better discussion with the stakeholders, right? And always this creation of analytic tools and uh, creating this data use uh, entire mechanism, it's a multi-sector collaboration, right? So you need, you always need subject matter experts. So you may have seen like when you are doing this uh, uh, discussion uh, at the group level, if you are not familiar with how the immunization program works, some of these things may not make much of a sense, right? Now, especially when someone asks, what would be the cutoff level we should set, right? This comes with experience uh, and the knowledge that you have with the program. So definitely you need subject matter experts as well as uh, the DHIS2 experts, right? Both the, uh, these people are required. Otherwise, subject matter experts might just go and present to high level stakeholders of things which are out of the scope of DHIS2. So you need a good collaboration with uh, both these type of people uh, uh, to achieve a better implementation. And then you should, uh, these discussions, after these discussions, there has to be a proper roadmap, right? Uh, in which you will be outlining how various outputs will be implemented in DHS. Okay, so the thing is like, you have to discuss what are the requirements that they want in their visualization outputs first. So for example, they may just ask a couple of charts. But then once you show them these charts, they may ask, okay, can't we also do something like this? So, I mean, like what can actually happen in this initial discussion is uh, uh, one thing is they may get too overwhelmed with what you are trying to present. 
or else there will be a, like a, a, a flooding of requirements that are coming from this uh, the program aspect where you may really struggle to implement everything. I mean, implementing everything is not customized in DHIS2 instance, right? I'm talking about an end-to-end -end solution where you customize, you train, and you create a mechanism where you can do a proper monitoring of whether they are using it. So to do all that, trying to overwhelm with all the like possible outputs in DHIS2 and the visualizations is not a good way. So this is where you can create a roadmap and mention, okay, we will implement these few uh, in this program in phase one, then phase two, phase three, like, right? So maybe if they want total custom, you can, you know, like uh, uh, keep it to the last or maybe just try to implement with a smaller set of users so that you can closely monitor whether it is being useful or whether they're actually using it because these custom developments take a lot of resources, a lot of time and um, effort as well as money. Right, and um, in case of an existing DHS2 instance, what you can actually do is you can review the existing output and see whether people are actually using them or sometimes they may be in obsolete uh, DHS2 versions. And if you can actually upgrade to a later DHS2 instance, the visualizations can get en enhanced better. Right? So this is something you can uh, do. Uh, I mean, something very simple so most of the time that you can start with. And then uh, you can also consider developing new outputs which are not there. So for example, uh, two uh, analytic applications that we, we tend to discuss in Analytics Academy in the past, which we did, did not discuss uh, this time, are Scorecard and WHO Data Quality Act. Because we, we felt that we cannot cover the entire content within these two weeks. We, we uh, didn't include those two. But like there are many applications which are, um, enhancements uh, that are available in the DHS2 app hub you can use, right? So using them, you can actually uh, develop new outputs. But like whatever you develop, you have to be mindful that you better test it in a safe environment uh, before actually making them available to the end users. Otherwise they might get confused um, if uh, you, you tell them that you should be seeing this, but then they're actually not seeing it. So that is one thing. And then again, um, uh, what you can do is maybe you can have an initial pilot phase to get feedback from the end users uh, on the visualizations that you have created. Okay. So any questions up to this point? That's mostly being me working. And I heard that uh, uh, word of the day should be working now. So you can try it in the meantime. Any questions up to this point? In that case, we can proceed. Fine. Right. So when we are setting up DHIS2, now I know that this is an analytic tools academy and this is not a server administration academy, but the thing is uh, you have to know what is the infrastructure and the resources that you have in your country setting, right? Because the simplest reason is the uh, analysis that you are trying to develop and visualize and the number of uh, hits that DHS2 instance is getting for a given analytic visualization has a major implication on the server resources. So why I said that is most of the DHS2 server resources are consumed by analytics. So for example, I can mention a very fresh uh, scenario that we are going through in Sri Lanka. So we are having a COVID immunization tracker, a national level immunization tracker in Sri Lanka based on DHIS2, right? So some, uh, and then we have the entire country population pre-registered, adult population pre-registered in the DHIS2 track. So we are talking about 16 million track entity instances in our vaccination DHIS2 instance, right? So every time we uh, make uh, analysis visualization, Right, based on say like number of people registered, number of people, number of men registered, female registered. So all these require, uh, 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 you know, the, um, the database which is like which is which is uh, everything is working in SQL, right? So all these uh, visualization uh, that we request from the DHS2 instance uh, are consuming too much of resources from our servers, right? 
So this is where you have to see, you have to have, a, you have to be mindful of like, I mean, this particular visualization, is it available to all the end users? Or if it is a very resource heavy visualization, is it only available to few people at national? So all these things you have to keep that in mind, right? So this is where sometimes in most of the countries, they have a production aggregate data instance and sometimes a tracker data instance. So these are two separate DHS2 instances. And the other thing, you should not try out everything on production instances, because one thing it can get really cluttered, your production instance, and nobody will know what, how many visualizations, favorite items are saved, which are not actually used, right? So a better practice would be, uh, while these two, or like sometimes some countries just have one DHS to instance for production, you should always have um, a development instance for each of the production uh, DHS2 instances. So in case if we have a separate aggregate data DHS2 instance and a production uh, DHS2 tracker instance, it's always good to have uh, separate development instances as well. So you test it in these ones and once the entire thing is, I mean, you are satisfied with the performance and everything, you can push it to aggregate instance. So that's, that's a good practice. So next we will talk about something very important when it comes to um, implementing analytic tools, which is about the country capacity. Okay, right. So implementation of analytic tools essentially require a wide variety of skill sets. So this skill set that we are talking about should include right, understanding of all the different analytic capabilities that are within the DHS. Right? So for this one, you need some a DHS2 expert who, who knows what is possible in DHS2 and more importantly, what is not possible in DHS2, right? So otherwise you might commit uh, to saying that we can do it in DHS2 and you find that it is not possible. So uh, you will cause disappointment um, at, at your level as well as the program side. And then yeah, you need the configuration required to support the creation of these outputs. So you need to have access and know-how of how to configure. And you need to have knowledge on how each analytic tools can be used to generate specific outputs uh, based on the different requirements, right? And how these could potentially be leveraged by custom solutions if required. I'd say, for example, if certain output is not possible in DHS2, within the DHS2, how can you use a custom solution to complement uh, what is already there? That knowledge you have to um, have. And then uh, you need also the program specific knowledge on how to interpret and utilize the data that is produced by these outputs, right? So that's also required. You may have all the technical knowledge, but if you don't have the program knowledge, you may not know uh, which visualizations to create and how to use them. And because of that, we need subject matter experts, right? So we need people from program sites, and then we also need the implementation and configuration staff, right? And so there needs to be a discussion between these two parties at least on designing what are the outputs that are required, right? And then uh, it's always, because of that, it's always a collaboration that happens frequently with these um, uh, two entities, and that ha there has to be a very good sync between these two entities to uh, when you are designing the dashboards and the visualization requirements, right? And also you may need support to maintain the infrastructure, which we discussed previously, right? Because you have to know, like if you are having a very large uh, data set or like you are going to have large number of um, end users who will be accessing system, you will always have to discuss with uh, whoever uh, from the infrastructure side to see whether you have uh, the uh, the, the relevant infrastructure available and the support is there to make it. Right, so when it comes to training of staff, it's always a challenging business, right? And this is where you have to review the, each of the outputs and visualizations, right? And decide which visualizations should be made available for end users at which level in your, uh, say, organizational hierarchy. So based on that, you may also have to evaluate the type of training that you have to provide at different levels, okay? And then um, you may also need to revise uh, the existing available outputs and see whether these are being used properly, or maybe you need to uh, focus on feedback loop, right? 
and um, so that end users will be provided uh, some knowledge on how to analyze and how to define the outputs that are generated at their level, right? So all these have to be considered when you are uh, designing a training program, right? And again, something um, which is also more important is how to provide continuous support. So this training program, we may be able to do once, but like what are we going to do for uh, people who miss the training program, right? So for example, when we are doing this academy, what can we do for participants who don't uh, join the live session, right? So we need to have a backup. So similarly, you also have to think what to do if, uh, I mean, like if someone, I mean, if they require refresher training, right? If they, uh, if we need to, you know, like uh, plan the trainings in such a way where we will have a couple of levels. So we train them on some basics first and then let them use the system for a couple of months. And then we may have a advanced training likewise. So all these have to be thought about uh, well in advance before you conduct the training program. So otherwise, what might happen is like, even now, okay, now when we are doing this training, we always uh, define our boundaries, right? We mentioned up to this point we cover, right? But these particular uh, components we are not covering in this training program. So likewise, you will have to define it in advance. Otherwise, your training programs will be so cluttered and you may uh, disappoint everyone because like some of, because you may get a mix of uh, participants with different skill sets. So that is again, something you can think of how to categorize, filter out participants that you are getting for a uh, separate training program. So this uh, concept on how to organize a training program, maybe not just uh, relevant to analytics, but for in any, any type of implementation in general. So with this, uh, another important aspect that we have to think is think about is whether we have a DHS to four team, right? So this I will mention, like in most of the countries, if you have a HMIS, right, Health Management Information System based on DHS two, then we are thinking about DHS two national level core team. But in some countries, so for example, in in Sri Lanka, we have uh, multiple DHS two instances run by programs. So in that case, that program has the total authority uh, over that DHS2 instance. So then we are talking about DHS2 core teams for the programs. So it really depends on the context that you are trying to apply, right? So you need to have a, this core team uh, well in place and established before you starting the DHS2 implementation, right? So this core team does not have to be a formally organized one, but what we try to mean is like, you need to have this capacity. So they have to, I mean, this core team can in, uh, include the program staff, right? Who are experts on various, on, on the particular health program, or if you are talking about HMIS, uh, on like broad set of programs, like some one from hospital systems, one from preventive healthcare systems, one from uh, community health system, likewise. And then we need to have implementation staff who will be responsible for configuring and conducting the training program, things like that. And then, we also need the IT technical staff, right? Uh, who can support maintenance and upgrade of all different DHS2 systems, right? Uh, because they will be the one who will be maintaining uh, the server part, right? And if you want to have multiple DHS2 instances or else if your analytics are, uh, are consuming too much of resources, how to fine tune uh, the server resources. So for these things, you need a technical IT staff as well. So now you will realize like, it's a kind of a mix of people that you require to have a DHS to core team. But of course, in, in, in very resource limited settings, as well as in some uh, 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 very uh, context specific scenarios, we may have a couple of people who are kind of uh, cross expertise. Like you may have uh, hybrid people who are tech experts and program experts, as well as uh, 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 who has this uh, implementation and configuration capacity. So, but in general, you need to have a team who has all these capacities, right? And this core team should be involved in training activities together in order to foster a teamwork and um, where we can have uh, uh, ideas exchange, right? So because uh, the, each aspect that is coming from each of these categories are important. It's not that always the implementation is the one that lead, no, not really. Then, I mean, if you think of it like that, then, uh, there may be frictions, unnecessary frictions, which might affect your implementation. Right? And then to solve problems, you have to get uh, uh, opinions from different uh, people, right? 
And then you also need to appreciate each other's role in the system. Right? So you can't run a system without having each of these categories. Right? Otherwise, it's going to fail. So it's always respecting what the other person is doing. Right. Uh, so any questions up to this point? We have a few more slides, which I'm trying to uh, finish faster, but uh, because I, we talked in last few slides mainly about capacity and uh, um, DHS to core team, any questions we can discuss at this point or else I, I will proceed. Right. So the thing is like after doing all these things still, uh, it may be very difficult to address all the gaps in the capacity, right? Because uh, that's how in the most, I mean, that's the scenario in most of the countries when you try to uh, uh, start DHS to implement a deviation, at least in the uh, very low resource countries. So in that sense, uh, if this happens, then you may have to find some expertise which is available outside of the country, right? Or else, uh, uh, I mean like, but then, there is a kind of a issue with the resilience of the system when you try to depend totally on outside expertise. So you can obtain expertise from outside the country, but then you need to build capacity from using that expertise, right? You should not totally depend on expertise which is outside of the country because that's not going to be that much sustainable. So at least uh, uh, a moderate level capacity has to be there for in your country, within your country for you to sustain an instance. Right. And in the meantime, you have to identify the gaps which are there, right? And and create a plan of action to um, expand your country's capacity over a period of a couple of years, right? Because capacity building is not um, something that you can do in like one or two months. So you have to have a um, yearly plan with the proper budget allocations and things like that, so that these uh, trainings and the capacity building takes on. So most of the countries which have successful implementations have gone through this uh, process and that's how they are, uh, I mean, like they have very good implementations. It's not something uh, that can that you can achieve overnight. So that's one thing you have to realize if you study the situation of all these countries who have successfully implemented DHS2, this is the uh, uh, secret behind their success, okay? Right, and then um, as I mentioned before, if you don't have the capacity, always make include those uh, steps in how to obtain the capacity from outside in your plans. Okay, right. Now, in case the, D, the, the relevant DHS to uh, relevant requirements from the program, we cannot uh, meet them with the standard uh, analytic tools which are available in DHS to, what are the other options we have? So for these things, we have custom tools in DHS to. So for example, we have three main custom tools. First one is standard reports. And then the other thing that is a common requirement nowadays, especially with this COVID is public web portals. And the next thing is custom maps. So basically what standard reports mean, uh, I think we briefly discussed about it uh, when we are doing the reports app, is like in case uh, there are requirements, reporting requirements, or uh, to produce, there's a requirement to produce a document, a report in a specific layout, right? which we cannot just do by arranging various items inside the dashboards, then what we can do is like, we can make a make something called standard report. So basically the standard report is a very, uh, uh, very cost, uh, I mean, a very specific development. So you require uh, to design something in HTML using sometimes the DHS2 web API, right? So, but ultimately by doing that, you can design a very custom made a report in the DHS2 platform in case your program requires. Uh, the advantage is it will really, you know, uh, please your end users and the program because they get what they really want in the proper order. But the downside is, of course, uh, you need the expertise to do some additional development and coding so that you require to have. The public web portals, we, what we simply mean is like most of this DHS2 information that we have in the dashboard and everything is only available to a user who has access to DHS2. But in case if we want, if our country's context or the program requirement visualizations in their own website, or else to have a separate website which displays the output of DHS2 visualizations, then this is what we mean by public web portal. And custom application in general, what we mean by that is any 
you can think of any third party uh, solution which is not DHS, right? So they have uh, custom uh, uh, screens or custom user interfaces, right? And uh, reporting gen uh, generations, visualizations, things like that. But what we try to do is we try to do this uh, custom development inside DHS2 as a customer. So I will briefly show you a few examples for each of them. So this is one uh, example for standard report that we see for malaria. So you can see here the layout and visualizations that we see here are very different, which, sometimes, which uh, we, we cannot just achieve by having uh, a, a dashboard, right? So here, what happens is the data, the filtering of data and which data items to pull, as well as how they are displayed and uh, laid out in the report, everything we can change, right? The uh, precise, you know, like very precise locations we can change. But to do that, we need capacity on um, HTML, at least on handling uh, HTML and JavaScript as well as the web API. Uh, so with that, you can um, develop this, uh, uh, this standard report, right? So this is a possibility. You can always mention this is possible, but we need some expertise. And here it's an example from Lao um, on a public dashboard. So what they have done is, this is a website right, uh, public, web, public web portal, but the data is pulled from their live DHS2 instance. So the end users, they uh, basically not the end users, the general public, they can just visit this website. I mean, just like any other website that they visit and they will not uh, ever log into the DHS2 instance, but they can still access the data. But then again, this required some uh, close uh, careful development so that we don't compromise the DHS2 instance of security. Uh, but we uh, also, in addition, uh, give the required data to outside. But then this again requires some tweaking and uh, development uh, work uh, to get this public dashboard developed. Right. And then custom application. So for example, what you are seeing here is one custom uh, visualization we have done for contact mapping, contact tracing visualization, right? So. Now, this contact mapping and contact tracing is a major requirement which is coming with COVID pandemic and other communicable diseases. But we don't have this mapping visualization available in a core app in DHS. So this is one visualization. We have, uh, uh, in fact, a custom web application. Our team initially designed in Sri Lanka, but uh, later on, there were like we, we identified there were generic requirements coming from multiple countries. So we released this as a generic web application. So available in a DHS2 App Hub. So if you go to DHS2 App Hub, there are, there are a number of DHS2 custom web applications, which you might which might even fit into your requirements. So please uh, check, check out the App Hub and see the apps which are available. Sometimes some of these might be useful to produce custom analytic outputs, right? Okay. And this is again another custom visualization we have done for uh, ICU bed tracking in Sri Lanka. So, these are all examples of custom visualizations and analysis, which are possible in DHIS2. Okay, right. So with this, we come to an end of the presentation that we have on implementation considerations. Do you have Hello, um, Pamot. Yes, could I yeah. ask a question? Yes, please. Um, yes, um, the custom um, tool is very interesting because uh, it seems um, we can able to do anything that uh, existing feature in the edge who cannot. Um, one more thing I'm worried, um, and I also face too, um, at some point, like, um, the data pro uh, indicator or program indicator that I uh, uh, calculate inconsistent, uh, so we need to uh, check back and forth every time. And the my my problem is um, only uh, solution anyway that uh, we can post um, uh, the generate uh, visualize uh, with people pivotable or data visualize to the end user because. Um, the data is not yet uh, fit and inconsistent. So when the user look um, the chart or the custom report, so it will strain uh, or it will um, 
something uh, problem and need to uh, back and forth again. So uh, any DHS who can uh, pause when the data not yet ready to public. Uh, sorry, uh, if I understood it correctly, uh, do you mean like whether we have a solution to push the uh, outputs, the visualizations that we have in DHS to like give a table and um, I mean, this, uh, visualize uh, maps and things like that to the uh, user level, maybe uh, without uh, getting them logged into the dashboard and see it. Is that your requirement? Uh, the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, uh, it's supposed to the dashboard, but uh, the, uh, our data is not a uh, consistency. So we need to uh, take a time to uh, fetch or do something uh, before right. coming to the dashboard. Oh, so, okay. So is it like just that uh, uh, you mean like uh, you have some visualizations in DHS too, but you want to uh, put it into a public facing uh, portal and you want to do some modifications before it goes to public facing uh, portal. Is that so? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, okay. So I will answer the, both the questions. So the first, uh, I mean, the first I understood like, is there a way to push the uh, analysis? the uh, end users or like, I mean, program users without asking them to log into DHS. So, so it's like, I mean, I, I receive a daily summary or a daily report of uh, visualizations as a report in email. So this, this is what we mean by push analysis. Uh, this was a feature available in DHS too. It is still there, but it has some, some, some uh, major deficits. Uh, so, my answer to that one is like we have this feature in DHS to call push analysis where you can send uh, the visualizations, maybe a dashboard to the end user's email. Uh, we can set it up so that it automatically gets sent every morning, something like that. But it, it needs some develop, uh, it needs some fixing, some core functionalities with the last few versions. So that is being attended by the DHS2 core team right now. So let's hope at least maybe. Um, in 2.37, we will have a good version of push analysis. So that is, uh, I mean, that, that's one thing. And about the next one, of course, it's a tricky one. Like uh, if you want to like review the data and uh, push some specific outputs to the public portal, then you need to do, I, I, I believe you need to do some, some uh, additional development on top of it. Because right now what you can do is you can set up this data approval mechanisms and things like that so that we can uh, determine only the approved data is visible. I mean, I mean that kind of measures we can do. But even after that, you have to decide like even out of the data which is available to the DHS within the DHS too, we want to refine it further and push it to the public portal. Then I guess we have to do some custom modification uh, where to decide like how at which point we are doing uh, this. Uh, I mean approval or pushing that thing. So that's what we can do. Uh, Saurabh, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, but uh, I don't know. A technical is uh, easy to implement. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging task. But again, it's not impossible. But uh, you'll have to really th think through uh, what you want to achieve and how to do it. But it's possible. Yep. Thank you, Pam. Yeah. Any further questions? Right, so if there are no more questions, thank you so much for, I mean, we have taken like additional 20 minutes. Uh, I mean, I, we, we expected it because like today we, we plan to do a lot of engagement. So we had to uh, put some uh, additional time for that as well. But I hope that uh, you found today's uh, session and the way we conducted it uh, a bit more palatable with regard to uh, engagement with your colleagues as well as the facilitators. So. Um, I guess that's all what we have for today. We don't have any graded assignments today. And the word of the day, uh, oh, hold on, I should uh, display the word of the day for participants who are... Um, referring to the offline uh, presentation. So this is the word of the day for today, descriptions. Right. So uh, please proceed with the uh, ungraded assignments, which is available in the edX. Um, and then also, please don't forget to uh, give us the feedback. We really appreciate and we go through the feedback every day. So please give us the feedback for today's session and any previous sessions that in case you have forgot. And also mark the attendance, the word of the day, uh, because uh, 
this will expire tomorrow morning. Uh, in that case, I think that is all what we have for today. And tomorrow is the uh, comprehensive exercise. And before that, Saurabh, uh, you want to brief the participants on next two days. Yeah, so um, we have the comprehensive exercise tomorrow. We'll do that on edX. Uh, so it would be a set of questions which you need to perform on the exercise instance and answer the questions and we'll be there to support you in case you need any help with any of the questions. And then on Friday, you'll have the final exam, which would be a set of multiple choice questions uh, based on the topics that we've covered uh, in the last 10 days. So uh, we hope you guys to see you tomorrow and day after uh, because both the comprehensive exercise and the exam are your major components for uh, uh, qualifying for the passing certificate. So please ensure that you're there and you are uh, appearing for both the comprehensive exercise as well as the, the final exam. So thank you for joining today and we look forward towards full attendance at least the next two days so that you're able to pass through uh, the major graded part now as you've covered all the topics we intend to cover in the agenda. Thank you. Hello. 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 Yeah, I just have one question. Yes. What is what will be the timing for the exam? I mean, uh, it, and day after yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, the timing should remain same. Would be one to four, but the exam would be would be around forty questions. So you'll have around uh, one hour fifteen minutes to do that. So once you're done with that, then you could leave. So there's no uh, need to stay till four. But the timings, uh, the duration would remain same, one to four. So we have to be there on that time only, or we can do it later on offline also. Uh, you can do it offline, but we would suggest you do it uh, together so that uh, if there are any computations needed that we can do uh, at that present moment. Uh, but I'll also try to figure out till yeah. when the exam is active or it's uh, open for a certain period. I'll update you guys on that tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Because tomorrow, so, uh, because the day after tomorrow, it will not be possible. So I was uh, just thinking to ask you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, I think the for the exam, uh, we will we will we will uh, raise you a concern to the uh, the I mean the the, the the academy. But usually, what we do, uh, the exam, the final exam, we have it um, open to everyone uh, at the same time. Uh, I mean, due to, of course, some logistics issues in grading and things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, but but we will still try to raise it. But for everyone else, for time being, uh, just uh, try to be present a day after tomorrow because uh, it's going to be online as of now. But uh, we will we will get back to you on this uh, tomorrow. But uh, comprehensive. Just one, just one query: if we if we join late because I'm busy till two two thirty. Yeah, I think we can discuss uh, 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 with the team and get back to you on this. We'll try okay, to. Okay, yeah. okay. Day after if tomorrow. Any... I'm, yeah. I'm talking about day after tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm available. Right. Yeah. Tomorrow, of course, it's not a major issue because it's a comprehensive yeah. exercise, something similar to what we have been doing last couple of days. But exam is the bit of a tricky one because uh, we, we we expect everyone to do it together. Uh, so, but, but if if we just ask uh, if there is any possibility of joining late, then I can join by two thirty or so. Sure. We will we'll get back okay. to you. On. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Right, so if there are no more, uh, yeah, there are some questions in the chat. Sorry, now just now only I'm seeing it. Uh, Saurabh, any more messages? Uh, any announcements? No, Pamod, I answered the questions on the Zoom chat and I'll check the Slack if any questions, I'll put the answers to, to those questions right. there. Thank you, Saurabh. Okay, then. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for uh, I mean uh, being with us, uh, even though it was a Kind of a lengthy session. So see you all tomorrow for the comprehensive exercise. Please don't forget to uh, give us the feedback and uh, mark your attendance. And uh, tomorrow we will do the comprehensive exercise. So thank you very much. Bye. Bye.